the Westland Historical Society presents Field Goals and Touchdowns, Early Football in Oregon by one of our valued members and distinguished author, Dee Dee Montgomery. Dee Dee generously volunteered to be our first virtual presenter and selflessly organizes our Ignite events and author talk series. Dee Dee is a sixth generation Oregonian with ties that span the region. Please join me in welcoming our presenter, Dee Dee Montgomery. Hit it, Dee Dee. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, everybody. This is really fun. Um, <laughs> it's fun already. Okay, Louis, you're not allowed to talk. You're supposed to be <laughs> muted. Um, it, it's really great to have, um, especially some people I haven't seen in a long time. I am not a historian, and I'm not apologetic about that, but I love, I, I love some of the history I've learned, um, as some of you know, and some of the writing I've done. And I was asked to give a talk like this for the Multnomah Club a couple weeks ago. Um, and I did it for them, but it was only for their members. And I thought, well, it, it's kind of an interesting story, and let me expand it a little bit. So in this talk, I'm not going to talk so much about the MAC, although I will a little bit, about the Multnomah Athletic Club. But I'm going to try to talk a little bit more about football. And um, since I saw Ron Chapel was signed up, I figured I got to do a couple of high school slides as well. So I expanded a little bit. Uh oh. Oh, there we go. Sorry about that. So just a, a, a note, I know some of you have been so awesome following my books. And I was just going to mention part of the story I'm telling is in the book on the right, which is a newly released ebook only. I, I came out in February which, with, which is really a lot of my blogs, if you've been following my blogs for the last couple of years. Um, some of you have read my memoir that's on the left, and I will be mentioning some characters today because I felt it was kind of important, but I won't be going into a lot of deep story on them. So if you have any interest in reading more, about early Oregon and uh, particularly some of the family members I'll be talking about. You can find it on my website, either through the books. I also have a few videos um, linked there from previous book talks that I've given. So it, I felt it was really important to at least place some of these people. Like, how is it? I'm mostly going to be talking about my great grandfather, but I felt you needed to know, well, how he came into my life, or rather how I came into his life, I guess is a better way to say it. And so I, I certainly need to go back a few generations and talk about my great, great, great grandparents. Um, and many of you know this, I'm gonna be really brief, but William Wilson was, was a carpenter with the Jason Lee missionaries. He arrived here in the Oregon, really the Oregon country in 1837 as the carpenter with the missionaries. And Chloe Clark, my great, great, great grandmother, arrived three years later as the 21 year old teacher, also with the Jason Lee missionaries, sometimes called the reinforcement, arriving in 1840. They met while based in Nisqually, which of course was part of the Oregon country in those days, later to be very soon after the territory. They soon after lived at the falls, which we know as um, Oregon City today and Salem. And again, lots of stories about those two and a couple people on the screen that are also related to these people. So that's kind of fun. Hi, guys. Um, but I need to kind of continue to move on here. And so as I mentioned, those are my great great grandparents. Well, uh, Chloe and William had three daughters. And their oldest daughter, Frances, married a guy you've maybe heard of before named J.K. Gill. This happened after William died, and it's a rather interesting story about how Chloe was first introduced to JK um, in Massachusetts, and his introduction to Oregon as a fairly young man. Again, another, I think, fascinating story that you can read about another day. And those, of course, are our, several of our great-great-grandparents, or I guess, Harry, it would be great-great-great, along with my daughters, or our daughters. Um, JK eventually took over half of a drugstore William had opened. And then he opened his own bookstore in Salem in 1866. That's the picture on the left. And you know, as I would say, the rest is really history. Uh, JK moved to Portland not long after, taking um, his wife and his mother-in-law with him, opening a book and stationery store in downtown Portland. And again, we could talk a really long time about J.K. Gill, and I'm not going to do that. 
but it's certainly worth saying this store is well known to anyone who grew up in Portland with a downtown Portland presence for about 130 years. Gills was located in the building pictured on the right that was at Southwest 3rd and Alder beginning in 1893. It was in two buildings prior to that in its earliest years in Portland. Then Gills moved into this building that you may very well recognize. Um, on the left, that was in fact where the, the Gills moved after they left Third and Alder. And that location is Southwest Fifth and Stark or um, Harvey Milk today. And Gills was in that location from 1921 to 1990. So if you remember shopping at Gills as a kid or a young adult or whatever age you were that was that was the building and some of you know the built the picture on the right um well i should say I, I don't recall if i said that was called the gladys mccoy building when multnomah county bought it in 1990 and it was it housed the multnomah county health department for quite a few years the picture on the right i took really right before we were all told to be home for a very long time um, i was lucky enough to be given a tour on this building that is now going to be renamed the J.K. Gill Building. And it is under uh, construction at the moment, or had been. Uh, you can see a couple people in safety vests uh, down on the curb of that building, and they were the ones that just had given me a tour the day I took this picture. And it'll be you know, a, a large, very nice building, but they do hope to show books, uh, have some decor around books and stationery in the early Gill days in that building. So I did have to do a little tangent since I know many of you were familiar with, with, with that person. Um, J.K. Gill and his wife, Frances, had five daughters and a son. And so this is actually where a couple of us on the call diverge, because I'm going to be talking about my great-grandmother, Georgia, who married a guy named William Montgomery. And this is a picture you can see of later in their life. But this is where we finally get to the family football guy. And um, William Montgomery lived to be 97. And uh, I'll talk a little more about that in a minute. So he was my grandfather's father, or my great grandfather as mentioned here. And just so you see how I'm connected, this would be his one of his two children, one of their two children. So Georgia, who we called Gaga, or I, she wasn't alive when I was a child, but she was called Gaga. And um, her husband, William, had two children, including my grandfather. And some of you have, again, if you've read my memoir, you've heard a little bit about him. Um, he was, uh, we called him Daddy Dick. Uh, he was a author, a historian. Um, he was probably best known for his book called The White-Headed Eagle that was about John McLaughlin. And he went on to have an advertising company. Um, if you heard my talk last fall at the Museum of the Oregon Territory, I spoke a bit more about him. And I related how us grandkids commonly refer to him even today as an English country gentleman. Um, and then finally, there's my dad. Some of you have seen pictures of my dad more um, on the river, because that's really such a theme of the memoir I wrote. But this is uh, him after knee surgery at the Multnomah Club. Um, and some of you may know the pretty well-known trainer there, Joe LaPrenzi. Um, and then on the right, I love this photo. I'm not going to be talking about baseball. Sorry, Dan, I know that's your sport. Um, but in fact, that's my dad playing baseball as a teen at Wallace Park, which is in Northwest Portland next to Chapman, which is an elementary school that my grandfather went to, my father went to, and I have a nephew there now, which is kind of fun. Okay, let's get back to this guy. So, William, who you saw this picture earlier, well, he looked like this when he was about 18. And he had attended Wesleyan University in Connecticut. His father had immigrated from Ireland earlier in his life through Canada and ended up on the East Coast. And um, this is where uh, he grew up in New Hampshire. 
And this is where Wesleyan is where he was introduced to football as football was known then. So this is him right here. And, and so this is where we get into a little bit of history on football. And I know this is a really um, blurry image, but I had to use it for a couple of reasons. So remember, we're going back in time. So that picture of William was in 1884 when he was 18. But about a, a decade before that, in 1872, Harvard had adopted a version of football was fundamentally different than the rules used by a few other Eastern colleges like Princeton, Rutgers, and Yale, as an example. Harvard's rugby-like rugby rules permitted a player to pick up the ball and run with it or pass it. Unlike the other teams that played more of a kicking game, basically like soccer or what we know as soccer. The Harvard rules allowed a player to tackle an adversary regardless of who held the ball. And rather than abandon what was described as such a marvelous aggression outlet, especially as it was well established around Boston, the Harvard team turned down Yale's invitation to join what was a new intercollegiate association. And as a result of this, Harvard attempted to keep playing games, but it made them hard for, to schedule games against other American universities because their rules were so different. Because of that, it agreed to a challenge to play McGill University from Montreal. This was a two game series um, they, at Cambridge and they played under two different sets of rules. The first game they played under Boston's rules and the second game they played under McGill's rules. And um, the game featured a, a round ball instead of a rugby style ball. And some say this series of games really represented an important milestone. I should show you the other photo. This is theoretically from that game back in uh, 18, what did I say, 1874. Um, thanks to McKill University for having these photos available. In 1885, the athletic committee provided a report to the Harvard faculty. So, you know, almost 10 years later, or more than 10 years later, the athletic committee told the Harvard faculty that the football should be banned that campus because they felt that the sport at Harvard had degenerated into what was called modified mayhem. However, the next year, the rule changed and it allowed football to return to Harvard. And although they differed in rules, before long, the other teams seemed to realize they really needed Harvard to be part of their um, intercollegiate system. And this was really the decision that led to continued existence of what was really looked at it being rugby style football in America, and eventually leading to development of the American football game as we know today. Now, keep in mind, we're talking about 1886 here, and even up to 1890, football was really a novelty way out here in Portland. We're talking about what was happening on the East Coast. And in Portland, football was really only known by a few British ship apprentices who played a game that was a lot like Union football, or what we might know as rugby. And this is Andrus Field that sits at the center of Wesleyan University. And the school's record books boast it as the oldest continuously used football field in the country. They started playing, they're the Wesleyan um, Cardinals, and they started playing on that field in the 1880s. And so we have been told that our great grandfather played for Wesleyan. And that was how he in fact, uh, learn something about football. So what happened next is soon after graduating with a business degree from Wesleyan, William moved to Portland in 1889. And he came to teach English and English history at Bishop Scott Military Academy. Has anyone ever heard of Bishop Scott before? Raise your hand, not yet. Um, today, that is the site of Trinity Episcopal Church. 
So if you know Northwest Portland, I think we're talking at about uh, Everett and 18th Northwest. Um, that was originally the site of Bishop Academy School. And Bishop Academy was affiliated with the Episcopal Church and it was named for the Bishop Thomas Fielding Scott. The school had opened in 1870 to educate young men in good citizenship and prepare to enter the ministry. Later, a military department was added to the school before the academy had closed in, in 1905. But it was here that the first American football team was formed in, and foot, first football game was held in the Pacific Northwest in 1889, the year that um, uh, uh, William got there. And I just want to point this out for some of you that know Northwest Portland. I know this is a little blurry and I, I apologize. I need to look up the citation for this book, but you can see where Bush up Scott Academy was located. Um, and we just mentioned that. And then a few blocks away, JK Gill and Francis lived. So that was where um, I assume some of, I can't recall exactly what years they lived there and how old their kids were when they lived there. But what also I find really interesting is all those houses that have tiny numbers next to them are names you probably rec you might recognize because of up streets today or um, parts of town. So you might see Flanders on there and Hewitt, um, Wilson, a different Wilson with one L, uh, uh, Lewis, Lombard, and so forth. So clearly this was, you know, and this is where we know there's a lot of old historic homes down in Northwest Portland. I would also mention, of course, Slabtown, which you've probably heard of before, but that name calling Northwest Portland Slabtown comes from the lumber mills that first populated the in industrial area with laborers. Mills would sell slabs of log edges cut to square logs as a cheap source of fuel. And that was really why even today you'll hear people call that area Slabtown. So let's get back to football again. So in 1889, as I mentioned, Bishop Scott Academy organized themselves into this first collegiate team and it was coached by William Montgomery, probably because he was the only guy that had heard of football, at least football it was playing on the East Coast. At the same time, a notice appeared in the Oregonian asking men to show up in the Deacon building if they were interested in football. About 20 men, many of them English, showed up and formed themselves into what you've maybe heard of before, the Portland Football and Cricket Club. The Bishop Scott Academy team challenged the Portland club to a game, and that's the game I referenced earlier that is considered to be the first collegiate game in Oregon. Will Lippman and Ray Green were coaches for the Portland club, and I believe they had gone to Harvard. So I think that's kind of where they learned a bit about their football. Bishop Scott Academy ended up winning after scoring two touchdowns. And what I find incredibly fascinating about this is 1,550 people attended that game, which I don't know, that, that seemed like a lot of people to me in those days. And this is a, a screenshot of a news article that is from the Oregonian you'll see in 1902, but it's celebrating the 12th anniversary of the introduction of college football to the people of Oregon, or the people of Portland. It was on Thanksgiving Day, and I just wanna read a couple of things. Um, the contest was won by the, uh, the academic team score eight to zero. From that time, the game immediately took hold upon the amateur sporting fraternity and soon became pop the most popular of our, all sports. Maybe not everyone will agree with that, but um, that was an interesting article. And then the, the piece on the left is the blog I've referred to. So if you wanna see a little more and a couple more photos, um, I published that, uh, I posted that a couple years ago on my blog. Two years later, the, uh, did I do that right? I think I need to go back a slide. Um, that's okay. 
Two years later, in 1891, the Portland football and cricket team members invited anyone interested in forming a permanent athletic club to attend a meeting which led to the creation of, you know this, the Multnomah Amateur Athletic Club. So rather than MAC, for quite a few years, it was MAAC for the Multnomah Amateur Athletic Club and the folding of the football and cricket team. A few from the Bishop Scott Academy team, including my great, great grandfather, William Wilson, or sorry, William Montgomery, um, who you see right here, not wearing the turtleneck anymore. Um, they joined making up the original 26 members of the Multnomah Athletic or Amateur Athletic Club. I understand there was a bit of discussion about whether to charge a $10 initiation fee. Some felt that was just too much to do. And I think it's interesting. I have no idea. I don't, I'm not a member of the MAC, but I'm, I have no idea what their initiation fee is today. They rented the, a, a space on the third floor of the Willamette Block, which is Yam Hill today, down on 2nd Street, where they eventually installed a gym. Soon after, this team was challenged to a game by the Tacoma Athletic Club, which you can still find details about in an old Oregonian article. But I'm gonna read just paraphrase, or I'm actually gonna read just a couple sentences from the Oregonian article about this game. So, for the first time in the history of the two cities, athletes, athletes from Tacoma and Portland met yesterday in an athletic contest. It was a football game at the Oaks and the Webfoot 11 downed the city of destiny by a score of 30 to eight. This marked the beginning of football in the Northwest and it also demonstrated the fact that the young men were very clever athletes. The purpose of the MAC at that time and the, perp and, the, and the founders identified, and so these are all the founders of the Maloma Club, it was to form an amateur athletic association in Portland to field sports teams that could compete against clubs in Seattle, San Francisco, and Spokane. The MAC also played against collegiate teams for a while until the 1920s. And of the 26 MAC founders, 17 were football players. A number of these earliest MAC members were the young adult sons of some established German Jewish Portland businesses that you've maybe heard of, or businessmen. Their fathers, as an example, were the merchants Littmann Wolf and Company, the jeweler Friedlander, a wholesale grocer Lang and Company, and merchant politicians by the name of Goldsmith and Wasserman, who were both Portland mayors in the early 1870s. This is my favorite photo, I think, of all of them. I'm just going to tell you that. Um, in 1892, the club had rented an athletic field in Goose Hollow next to the 1887 Industrial Exposition Building, and they constructed a small grandstand. In 1893, the MAC moved its official building to Southwest 10th and Yamhill Street, where William Ladd built a clubhouse that he rented to the club for $3,000 a year. Now you guys know this location, and we'll get back to that. But this is another picture of that same location, um, clearly flooded in 1904 by the Tanner Creek that comes down um, in that part of Portland. I just got to do a little sideline because we're here, here now at about 1894. And after three years of teaching at Bishop Scott Academy, William married Georgia. I had alluded to that earlier, the sister of a college friend. And uh, Harry, uh, Harry's great, great grandmother would be Kate, a sister of Georgia, right? Am I right there? Okay. Um, Anyway, they were married and William had actually known that family, knew the Gill family because he had a college friend that was Mark Gill, the older brother. Eventually, William took over as president of Gills and held that position for 50 years. Music was also a hobby of his. Um, you'll see some pictures of light opera 
Um, that's Georgia in the picture on the left, on the right side. And that is William, you can tell, on the picture on the right side. Um, and, you'll, and I think it's interesting, if you can read there, the Deacon Building, by the way, where, um, where that picture was taken, but also the name McAlpin, which you'll hear again, because he was one, one of the McAlpins was one of the founding football players as well. Since I'm in duck country, I did feel into need to add a few extra slides here. Um, because we do need to mention that the University of Oregon Duck football program also began that same year that, Will, that um, William and Georgia got married in 1894. They played its first, it played its first game uh, in 1894, defeating Albany College under head coach Cal Young. In 1899, the football team left the state for this first time playing the California Golden Bears in Berkeley. Oregon's largest margin of victory came in 1910 when they defeated the University of Puget Sound 115 to zero, which I think is awful. <laughs> but anyway, go Ducks, right? Hayward Field was first constructed, you may not believe this, but it was first constructed as a football stadium. It had previously been a cow pasture when the university kept cattle to supply milk to the dormitory students. A creek ran through the lot, creating problems when the university moved the athletic field from Kincaid Field, where it had been, to this new location. Three feet of rock and coarse gravel had to be laid down and 12 to 15 inches of sandy soil on top. In this picture, which again, I thank, for, from, I thank Eugene or, or the University of Oregon for um, sharing this photo, um, two U of O Yale Kings, I guess they were called. Now our dad was a Yale leader at Lincoln High and I've always heard Yale late leader. And I had been corrected when I called him a cheerleader. He, didn't, he played football until he knocked all his teeth out. So my dad didn't play football be, beyond high school. But this caption says, two University of Oregon Yale Kings in the middle of a throng of students at Hayward Field on November 15th, 1919, prior to a football game against Oregon Agricultural College, which would be renamed Oregon State University. Um, this was the first game ever played at Hayward Field. And Hayward Field was their home, was U of O's home stadium until 1967. Of course, now we know the awesome stadium. Well, I got to mention the Beavers. So football at Oregon State University started in 1893, actually a year earlier than the Ducks started, shortly after athletics were initially authorized at the college. Athletics were actually banned prior to 1892. But when the strict school president, whose name was Benjamin Arnold, when he died, the new president, John Bloss, reversed the ban. Bloss's son, William, started the first team on which he served as both coach and quarterback. That's pretty tricky. The team won its first game 64-0 uh, against uh, Albany College in 1893. And as you all know, their primary rival is the University of Oregon, um, enjoying a very long-standing rivalry. And in our family, my mom was a beaver and my dad was a duck. So I know a little bit about that rivalry. The game between the two schools is called the Civil War and they've played each other 121 times, which makes it the seventh oldest college football rivalry game. So let's go back to Portland. Um, with membership of the MAC, nearing 1500 by the turn of the century. So as we got close to 19, the year 1900, the MAC built its first structure in Goose Hollow, just east of the field. This Chapman Street building opened in July 1900, complete with handball courts and a porch overlooking Multnomah Field. So if you can imagine, right to the left of this building was an arch and a road that led down to the field. There was a fire in 1910 of the exposition building just nearby and it spread to the surrounding area and burned the grandstand, the tennis courts, 
and the Chapman Street headquarters and the MAC relocated to across the field, if you can imagine it, where it is today on Salmon Street, on the other side of the field. And uh, the club then built an even larger facility on Salmon Street designed by noted architect and club member Morris Whitehouse. In 1911, former president Theodore Roosevelt participated in the dedication of the building and it opened for use at the annual meeting of 1912. It wasn't until 1936 that the club changed its name and it dropped that amateur name or the amateur word and now it was officially the Multnomah Athletic Club. So here you see um, a uh, picture of the MAC football team and you know, almost uh, two decades, two decades after when William Montgomery and those other original football players played in that same field. Okay, because I knew I heard Ron Chapel was going to be on this call, so I knew I had to mention West Lynn. So West Lynn High School, on September 22nd, 1919, Union High School opened. It had the union title because it was the only high school in the Portland metro area outside of Portland proper. And it thus unified the high schoolers of West Lynn and Wilsonville. The school has certainly changed its name a couple of times to West Lynn, U West Lynn hyphen Union High School, Oswego West Lynn High School. And finally, in 1938, it became West Lynn High School. So when it was Union High in 1922, and I really think, I didn't know this was on uh, Westland High School's website. So they've got quite a bit on sports, which is nice. So you can see that um, this is a 1922 boys sports football team. And I'm just gonna quote, read a quote for you that sits on that page. In her first attempt at interscholastic football, hung up quite a wonderful record. In a season of eight games, she was undefeated, winning seven games and tying one. And I don't know if any of you know any of the names on there. To notice Hammerley, right? I imagine that must be related to Hammerley Park. I don't know the um, history well enough to know that. So let's go back to Multnomah Field, or some, soon we'll refer to it as a stadium. I love this picture and I know this view quite well. Um, I grew up in high school, we lived just up the hill. And so I walked in front of the Mac to high school at Lincoln um, for my four years of my, of my career. Um, and this is in 1921, over 5,000 people overfilled the existing stadium for football when Oregon and Idaho played to a 7-7 tie. Two weeks later, 12,000 people watched the California-Washington State game. Now you might notice the grandstands didn't hold as many people as that. The grandstands held 3,300 people. And so you can see people lining the stairs, lining the field, and only those lucky ones fitting into the grandstand. By the mid-1920s, the club had outgrown the second grandstand at, Willan at Multnomah Field, particularly when either University of Oregon, Oregon Agriculture College, or what we now know is today's Oregon State University, and the University of Washington played football games at the field. As early as 1908, 10,000 people had attended an Oregon-Oregon State game and 30,000 people came to the stadium, as pictured here, in, eight, in 1923 to listen to President Warren G. Harding. That's a lot of people. When finances were tight in the, in the 1930s, the club found a new revenue source, as some types of betting were legalized in Oregon. A dog track was installed at Multnomah Stadium in 1933, and the Multnomah Kennel Club, was a tenant for the next 23 years. When the Kennel Club departed in 1956, the Portland Beavers baseball team became full-time tenants. I find this really interesting because when my dad had worked in advertising, one of his accounts was the Kennel Club, but I really had no idea 
that this is for in the early years before my birth that this is where um, the kennel where they were doing dog racing. So then, of course, we start to move ahead in time and Multnomah Stadium, later known as Civic Stadium, Portland General Electric or PGE Park, later gelled Wen Wenfield, and now today we call it Providence Park. That stadium was built in 1926 between Southwest 18th and 20th Avenues, as we've been talking about, on Southwest Morrison Street. But what you may not know is it was constructed at the expense of the Multnomah Athletic Club. And again, now you can think back to those other photos I showed. It was on the same site that was leased or owned by the club since 1893 with that very first grandstand picture um, for that spring of 1893. So William um, Montgomery and all those other fellow football players were playing on this same site. The, just the stadium didn't look quite like this. It was sold to the city of Portland as PGE Park in 1966. And at that point, it was considered the largest stadium in the Northwest. Now the picture on the right, I felt I had to throw in. Um, my dad, Dick Montgomery, was one of those kids in the 1940s who got hired by Rocky Benavito to operate the scoreboard at what was called Lucky Beaver Stadium or Vaughn Ballpark. So Dan, here's your piece on baseball. Um, in 2001, the old guys, the three old guys that included my dad and a couple of people he called the Holt twins, and they'd all gone to Chapman and Lincoln together. They got to be the first guys to operate the new scoreboard at PGE Park for the Portland Beavers in um, 2001. And Margie Boulay, who some of you may remember her as a columnist, um, wrote a story about that. And I um, just wanted to show this photo. I know it's a little grainy and I thank the author Donald Nelson for sharing this with me. But this is what Vaughn Street Park looked like in 1901. If you've heard of Lucky Beaver Stadium or Vaughn Street Park. Um, when my dad and the, the Holt twins and other scorekeepers like them were kids, they had to climb a rickety old ladder. And, and I'm talking about in the 1940s, not in 1901 but they had to climb a rickety old ladder at the Vaughn Park, hold the flag during the national anthem. And as my father would report, guess on what the announcer said for calls because they didn't have much of a PA system. So if they weren't counting very well on strikes and balls, they would commonly be off. Um, that site, just to show, um, although we're mostly talking about football tonight, that Vaughn's Park was also used to host the Mack track athletes at the 1905 Lewis and Clark Exposition, which I don't tend to think of activities like, you know, races happening during that fair that many of us think about down near Giles Park, but there were a number of other things going on that were associated with it. Okay, this one's for Roger. Um, and I'm going to use this as a lead in. So, and this is not a stadium picture. I know that, but I got a story, very quick story. My point is this site where these original footballers played and where we've all probably gone to games over the years, maybe more recently it's been Timbers or um, Thorn soccer games or uh, Ron, I think you coached a winning team in this stadium. Um, I would say the most exciting game that I've attended at the stadium that I still remember was the game that followed this game that you see the photo of. So in 1974, my brother Andrew was playing, he's number 25, and he told me this photo's been reversed. So if it looks weird to you, it's not my fault. The image was reversed. But he played football. He was a great wide receiver for the LeGrand Tigers and, and um, in this photo. And they won state playoffs in, uh, for the only time um, when you know, they were up against teams like, uh, they, they beat Corvallis in the stadium. But this is the game leading up to that. And so I just, I give that point because I so remember that game, even though it was so many years ago in the stadium. So I imagine everyone has a game or two that they might really remember from their time in that stadium. This is just a, a final view of the Multnomah Club from the Salmon Street side. 
Um, this was prior to its demolition in the 1970s. Wait, is it the 70s? I, I can't see my um, number on there. And then I want to kind of leave off with this. Um, on November 2nd, 1961, the Oregonian printed a story that included a photo of the first Mac football team. And this was four days after I was born, I realized. So um, in 1961, when this was printed in the Oregonian using this photo, um, William A. Montgomery was the only survivor of the original team. He lived to 97. And so um, he, he would have been, I think, 93 when this happened. Others on the team at the time, in addition to some of the names I mentioned before, were names you may recognize of many pioneer families. Dosh, McAlpin, I told you I was gonna mention McAlpin again. Courtney Lewis, Scott Brook, Chaplin. I've already mentioned Lippman and Green, Gavin, coach or Captain Savage, who had also been a coach for a while, Gleason, Holt, Fisk, Kendall, Ellsworth, McDonald, and Brooke. And some of you, I don't know if any of you are MAC members or have been, but you may recognize there was there is a uh, restaurant at the Multnomah Club called the Sports Pub, and they had a full menu for a while that they used that photo for. And uh, I think it was a few years ago because the food looks kind of cheap compared to today's standard. And so, you know, I'm not a football expert and if Russ wasn't muted, he would say I never watch football, except if I go to a live game and that's probably true. Um, I, I loved catching passes, that was my favorite thing. Get me beyond that and I, I'm not great at watching sports unless I'm actually at the game. But the point, I, I love this quote and you know, stories are like children, they grow in their own way. And, you know, I've told you some stories today, some that have passed through family, many of them have written documents that I tend to trust. Um, one example of the story is how William Montgomery's daughter, our great aunt Nan, loved to say that her father had the first membership card at the Multnomah Club. So, I don't know. I mean, maybe all of the 26 founders were all considered number one or the first card. I don't know how that works, but it's a good story, isn't it? Um, so on that note, I hope you, I'd be curious. I know we're going to come back on and um, maybe some of you might have some additional stories or facts or questions. And I will, um, oh, Dan Foss asked a question already. No, that J.K. Gill house is not, is not there anymore. I, I walked by it not long ago. It's, it's, a, it's a very nondescript structure. Um, wow, okay, there we go. MAC club initiation fee for 2020 is $6,000 an adult and lottery is going on now. So thank you all. I'd be happy to listen to anything. I, I hope you learned something new. That would be my question. Pam, can we 